Thank you. Um, can I welcome everyone to this event at the Royal Academy of Engineering? Um, this event, I'm told to say this event was originally initiated by the Energy Materials Group in IOM3. Um, and it is now being co-hosted by the Academy, the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining, and the Institute of Physics. So welcome everyone. Um, the more observant amongst you will have noted that unfortunately Richard Maudsley is un unable to attend um, and at the last minute. Um, so he apologizes to you and he's sending a stand-in in the form of myself. Um, I'm Richard Taylor, I'm the Chief Engineer of the National Nuclear Laboratory uh, and a Fellow of the Academy. Right, housekeeping first. I'm instructed to tell you all to turn off your mobile phones. There is a five pound fine for charity for anyone in <laughs> contravention of that particular instruction. Um, I'll check mine. There are no planned fire alarm tests, so if you hear an alarm, um, follow Alan. But the official instruction is please uh, to leave by these doors and assemble at Carlton Gardens just outside. Nice day for it. Um, the event is being videoed and it will appear on the Academy website at some stage. There is also a hashtag for the tweeters amongst you, which I'm going to have a go at reading out, hashtag NXTGenNook. So please use it if you have a burning desire to tweet. Um, we have six speakers, each of which will speak for about 15 minutes, um, and I'll make sure they do. There will be time for a few questions after each of the speakers, if you could restrict those to Points of clarification, please, because we do have a panel session at the end. Um, and there will be a break, a natural break after the third talk, at which we will be serving tea in two adjacent rooms, which hopefully will become obvious to everybody. Um, and after, after the presentations, there will be a drinks reception, which I think I can guarantee will be excellent uh, for those of you who wish to continue the discussion. Okay, so um, hopefully you've all seen the program. If I can just move on to introduce our first speaker, Professor David Mackay. Um, we're pleased to welcome David also at short notice, so we have something in common. Uh, he is the Chief Scientific Advisor of the Department of Energy and Climate Change and has done a, what, a lot of work on the possible pathways for the UK's energy systems to meet emissions reduction targets. And David is going to summarise this work and the role that the nuclear energy will play in the future. Thank you, David. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. I'm going to talk about three things. First, I'll sketch for you the government's position on what we're going to do about keeping the lights on and taking climate change action. Second, I'm going to describe to you what happened in March 2013 when the Beddington Review of Nuclear Research and Development uh, gave its advice to government and when on the same day the government responded to that advice. And then thirdly, I'll talk about what we have done so far, we in the sense of government in terms of implementing some of the actions that were committed to in that response in March. The Carbon Plan of 2011 uh, fulfilled the government's, government's legal requirement to describe how it's going to achieve its carbon targets. The graph on the right is depicting uh, carbon budget periods uh, off to 2050 and the color wedges are showing savings in various uh, sectors in terms of emissions. And the Carbon Plan uh, chops the future into to three uh, date ranges completing and preparing, what, what are we doing right now, um, mass deployment, and then finalizing. And in the electricity sector, uh, completing and uh, preparing means giving support to low carbon generation technologies that are expected to play a significant role in the, the future, especially nuclear carbon capture and storage and wind. And then you have mass deployment of those technologies in uh, a way that will eventually revert to uh, uh, competition, hopefully, and, and um, 
an increase in the amount of electricity supply is expected to be required as part of the 2050 uh, end game. In the carbon plan, we use the 2050 calculator as one of the tools to describe what the energy system might look like in 2050. The 2050 calculator, I hope you've, you've come across, it's an open source tool based on the laws of physics and the realities of engineering that allows you to, to have uh, technically achievable visions of how to uh, achieve uh, our targets for security of supply and, and carbon emissions reductions. And in the carbon plan, we indicated that government isn't choosing a pathway, rather we're trying to, make, to keep open a corridor of pathways, um, a corridor because we're uncertain about costs, some of the technologies have other uncertainties, uncertainties about public acceptability, and so forth. And so we published in the carbon plan four pathways that represent this corridor. A central cost-optimized pathway based on some central cost assumptions, of course all the costs are uncertain. And then a pathway that we called the higher renewables, more energy efficiency pathway, another called the higher CCS, more bioenergy pathway, and finally uh, a, a third uh, extreme of the, the corridor called the high nuclear, less energy efficiency pathway, which is what you'd believe if you don't get so much behavior change as you might hope for on the demand reduction. There still would be demand reduction and behavior change and technology change, but not as much as the central pathway. And what if CCS breakthroughs didn't uh, materialize, and what if the costs of renewables remained very high? That's the sort of thing you'd believe to get yourself into the high nuclear scenario. So we published those and the government's position is to keep all of these options open for the, the time being and review things as we go along. In a bit more detail, here are some numbers relating to those four scenarios and the, the high nuclear less energy efficiency pathway is the blue one in, in the middle and you can see that involves 75 gigawatts of nuclear capacity, so a slight more than a sevenfold increase in nuclear over today's levels. And in every pathway, heroic action is being taken on at, uh, at least one of the, the levers of supply or uh, demand reduction and uh, bioenergy. So that carbon plan from 2011 framed uh, the work of the Beddington uh, Review, which I'm about to, to come to. What was the situation uh, before the Beddington Review? Well, we had confirmed that We've got permission to put nuclear power stations on these new sites and businesses were planning uh, roughly 16 gigawatts um, of deployment within the next decade. And then along come the House of Lords uh, and their select committee on science and technology said what many other people have been saying for a while, well hang on, if you want uh, to get um, 16 gigawatts, uh, let alone 75 gigawatts, maybe you need to think about the government support for research and development and the maintenance of capability and skills in the UK, uh, which is something I uh, agreed with when they interviewed me as one of their um, subjects. Um, so what did government do in response to that critical House of Lords report? Well, it set up the uh, government's um, chief scientific advisor, John Beddington, um, with a, a board to give advice on how to respond. And the plan initially was that that board would spit out a roadmap uh, describing uh, what should happen to research and development for nuclear. And uh, in more detail, it was decided to have to publish three things, a review, a, a strategy, and a roadmap, and also an industrial a vision statement. So we uh, ended up with four things, and then through a nuclear proliferation, um, we ended up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, and a government response. So about nine documents that related to each other in this uh, chain reaction um, <laughs> were all published in March 2013. And is so much that ended up being published that I still haven't got through all of it. But I have got through the main bits, and uh, I'll tell you a bit about the R&D roadmap, which uh, was attempting to look at what R&D needs you would have Depe depending on what nuclear pathway you wanted to follow, and I'll tell you about the government response. So here's the R&D, uh, here's a figure from the R&D roadmap. The approach was to say, well, what do we definitely need in terms of R&D? What's the baseline? The baseline is, well, what would you need to do just to decommission all the existing reactors and sort out the waste? 
And then we had a couple of other pathways, one of which said, what would you need to do to be able to deliver between 16 and 75 gigawatts of new build by 2050 using an open fuel cycle? And the uh, top pathway was what R&D and capability and so forth would you need to be able to have a closed fuel cycle pathway <laughs> delivered by 2050. Here's one of the scenarios that was looked at for that top scenario, um, it, an example scenario delivering 75 gigawatts of uh, closed uh, fuel cycle reactors. Um, not all of them in 2050, in fact, but making a transition so that you're set up in 2050 to switch to a closed fuel cycle based, for example, here on sodium-cooled fast reactors, which is the model that France are currently pursuing for their nuclear fleet. Um, I, I apologize. This, uh, this um, graph is, is blurry uh, because I, I got it from someone else and they didn't give me high resolution. Sorry about that. Okay, lights down. If I say it, does it happen? <laughs> There's some little switches here. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Cool. Wow. It's a movable feast. Um, the R&D roadmap didn't just look at one uh, type of, uh, of fast reactor. It, it looked at the whole spectrum, including uh, mentions of small modular reactors and alternative fuel cycles. They were all in, in the, the field with no judgment expressed about what direction should be taken. And the government response uh, to this work by the Bennington Review is perhaps something you're most interested in. So I've highlighted here a few things from this roughly 100-page document. From the ministerial foreword, which is written by uh, Vince Cable and Ed Davey, two Lib Dem uh, secretaries of state, uh, here's a few paragraphs with some highlights in, in red uh, about the importance of R&D and innovation, government and industry making contributions of time and resource, and contributing funding for research and development, innovation, and skills. From the same document, there's a statement of what the objectives of this nuclear strategy of the government are, and it includes having world-leading facilities and conducting a program of fission-related research. And from the same document, there's a list of key actions that are identified, each with an owner and initial success measures and timescales. And I'm not going to go through all of them. I've enumerated how many there are in these four categories. And I'll show you just a few of the actions that are identified by government that it's intending to, to take or has already taken. So in the home market section, one of the actions is to establish and have successful operation of the Nuclear Industry Council, which will be responsible for delivery and development of the nuclear strategy. Under enhancing research, development, and innovation, there are five actions, and I'll show you all five. Uh, first, to do nuclear innovation and R&D coordination, there's going to be two things called NIRAB and NIRO, the Nuclear Innovation and Research Advisory Board, which looks suspiciously like just keeping John Beddington's uh, board going, well, and I think that's a fair way to, to, to think of it, and a Nuclear Innovation and Research Office, which will be a secretariat to that advisory board and will uh, have technical expertise. Secondly, in this group of five, future nuclear energy systems R&D. So there's going to be, uh, the government will keep under review 